In Principles in Life, Principles of Life, we're looking at areas of conflict and twice now I've recorded this and twice I've thrown it away. <laughs> and I know why now. I, I kind of knew why all along and it's like I've been wanting to make somehow this easier because this is meat. This isn't for the average believer. This isn't for the new believer necessarily. This is for people that are serious. So I've been trying to kind of hedge my bets, so to speak, or kind of make it eh, not quite so direct in conflict necessarily because I know what it's like to not understand what's going on or to really not get it. So I've been trying to make it easier in some way and God's not content with that. Because, to put it bluntly, if you want to, the old expression was, if you want to pussyfoot around, and go someplace else. Because if you want to get serious with God, that's what God wants to do, is get serious with you. So principles of life, we're not going to try to hedge our bets. We're not going to mince words. We're going to treat it like it is, a serious subject. So, in assurance of salvation, one of the conflicts, the first conflict you're going to run into in life is, are you saved? I don't know. Do you? I know I'm saved. Do you know if you're saved? You see, that's what you have to figure out. If you don't know that you're saved, every area that you are involved in of your life will be affected. If you don't have that confident assurance, that assurance of salvation as it's presented here, then you will have doubts and you will be like a ship tossed to and fro on the ocean just Whenever a whim of doctrine comes along, you're going to kind of like be pulled away by that. Whenever some emotional appeal comes along, you're going to be kind of yanked over by that. You have to know that you have salvation. We call it putting on the armor of God in some theological terms because it's called the helmet of salvation. You are putting on the knowledge that you are saved. Your brain, so to speak, is protected. Your head covering reassures you that you have your head focused in heavenly places and not on earthly. You know where you're going, you know where you came from, and you know who's going to get you there. That's the problem. If you don't know that, you need to stop what you're doing, get saved, get real, and get right with God. Because until you do, you really can't do anything. You're not going to be effective in any ministry. You're not going to accomplish anything by way of the Holy Spirit because He's always going to be trying to teach you something that you're resisting because you think you already know it and you're moving on to somewhere else. But your foundation, what you're standing on, the preparation of the gospel of peace, you have nothing to share with anyone because you're standing on shaky ground. You haven't assured yourself that you're saved. Now, how do you do that? Well, here we read that it's in 1 John 5.13. We know that in 1 John it states that, and this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in the Son. He who has the Son has life. He who has not the Son of God has not life. You have the Son or you don't? The answer is yes or no. Do you have the Son? My wife hates me in some ways because when I get serious about theology, I say, look, it is all a yes or no question. Jesus said that your yes be yes or your no be no. There's nothing in between. There's no lukewarm. There's no uh, gray areas. It's all black and white. It's straightforward. It is means what it says, says what it means. Everything that God does is exact and precise. Don't let people confuse you. Don't let them try to throw some simile at you or some metaphor or some way of interpreting that's theology, that's religion, that's not principles of life. That's not what God does in creation. God didn't say, well, I think I'm going to make something on the sixth day that might carry over to seventh, but you know, it might work on the fifth, but you know, we're going to kind of play it off on the fourth. No, God was precise. He did what he said, he said what he did. That's how we live. Yes is yes, no is no. Are you saved? I am. That's the answer. I am. Because I'm not saved because I made a choice. I'm not saved. I mean, these are things that I know now. I may not have known at the time. 
But I'm not saved because I made a choice. I'm not saved because I feel like it. I'm not saved because I have some theological background in order to understand all the process of sanctification and all these other things. I'm saved because God said so. That's it. That's your assurance. If God said so, you're saved. If God didn't say so, you're not. If you have the Son, you're saved. If you don't, you're not. Period. There's no question there. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. You, whoever you are, however you are, whatever brought you to knowing or thinking you know about Jesus, you need to go back to square one, root one, and say, hey, am I saved? You need to either discuss it with God, discuss it with yourself, or come to the conclusion by faith, by study, by proving these things are true according to the Word of God, that in whatever way you came to a salvation experience, you now can prove your salvation by stating to anyone, anywhere, at any time, yes, I am saved. I don't know about you, but I'm saved because I know Jesus. I have a personal relationship with Jesus. I leave the door open and I don't say, well, let's get into you know the whole idea of going before altar calls because altar calls are invented. They weren't there in the first place. Jesus never gave an altar call. I'm sorry. The whole idea of going to the woman on... The, the well is not a salvation message per se the woman discovered Jesus and found him but so did all the other disciples in different ways that were their salvation message come and follow me come and follow me come and follow me so they did and as they followed him they got saved so you see I'm not going to tell you that the woman in the well is a salvation message because frankly I don't get that <laughs> and I know a lot of people teach that I don't see that. I see Nicodemus coming to Jesus and saying, you know, hey, you know, we know that you're a man sent from God. And, and Jesus says, except you become born again, you shall not enter into the kingdom of God. I don't see that as a salvation message. I see that as a salvation description. you got to be born again. That which is born in the flesh is flesh. That which is born in the spirit is spirit. You must be born again. I don't know when or if Nicodemus got saved or when. I'm sure he did, but not at that moment. Sorry, it doesn't say so in the scriptures. We like to take from the Bible and then we make these little kind of cutesy little things that we think fit for the Spirit of God to work with. But the Spirit of God doesn't say that he needs us to help him to work with anything. The bottom line is you have to have the Son of God in you. You have to have the Son and the Son have you. This is the record. This is the truth or facts of the record. This is the record that God has given to us eternal life. And that life is in His Son. He that has the Son has life. He who has not the Son of God has not life. If you don't have the Son, you have not life. You don't have salvation. You may be on your way. You may be in the process. You may be making the choices. You may be getting close. But until you've got the Son, you don't have life. So, in assurance of salvation, your first conflict is a personal one. It's one you have with God and no one else. No one else has deceived you into salvation. No one else has conceived for you salvation. That is up to you to discover. God already said, I sent my prophets, I sent my pastors, I sent my teachers, I sent my elders, I sent all these people. So I finally sent my son. And Jesus said, hey, anyone that comes, into, comes unto me, I will in no wise cast out. Come unto me, all you that are labor heavy laden, I will give you rest. He spoke many ways and many times of how to come to him. And you can research that. You can read it. It's in red in most Bibles. But you can study that because that's what you need to do for your homework. That's what you need to do for your eternal life, to put it bluntly. That's what we call working out your salvation with fear and trembling. Because to put it bluntly, 
you're going to discover you didn't choose God. God chose you. He appointed for you a means of salvation. If you receive it, you'll be saved. If you don't, you'll be rejected. You're going to discover why we call it work out your salvation with fear and trembling because you realize you're not in control. God is. You begin to realize someone else is determining your eternal destiny and it ain't you. Before the foundations of the world, God wrote your name in the book of life. But, except that Jesus determined that you are His, God will blot your name out of the book of life. So, until you stand before Jesus or stand before God, one or two things is going to happen. Jesus is going to say, you're mine. And you'll never go before God and stand before the book of life and say, God, I don't know. But rather, Jesus will intercede on your behalf and be there, for you will be a son of God. But if you're not in Jesus and Jesus doesn't know you, you will stand before God Almighty. And when the books are open, he's only going to do one thing. He's not going to judge you according to your judgment. He's not going to judge you according to your wisdom. He's not going to judge you according to what you judged. He's going to just simply look and see if your name's written there. And if it's not, you're history. You're gone. If your name's blotted out, you're gone. It means that, hey, you know, you, you, you were meant to be saved. You know, everything was done that was according to what God wanted to do with your life. And you refused. So you're blotted. Sorry. Gone. Lake of fire determined to be eternally damned and tormented for the rest of eternity because you didn't do what God said to do. So, assurance of salvation can give you a great reassurance in some ways, but it can also produce for you something that will humble you in a very precise and determined way that God wants you to be humble because He wants you to have an assurance that God promised you you can know that you're saved. But that means you have to deal with God one-on-one. -on -one. You won't get away with sitting in the pew when you want assurance of salvation. You won't get away with listening to a pastor tell you you're assured because you have faith in the scripture. You won't get away with any of those things because you know right now, thinking on what you're hearing, you know you're dealing with God alone. And alone you will stand before Him. So, have that confirmation for yourself. Pursue it with all of your heart. God said, I will be found of those who seek me with all of their heart, with all of their soul, with all their mind, with all their spirit, with thirsting after God, with everything they have. Because I'll tell you one thing. We have six conflicts. This is one. And it's already got you shaking in your booties, doesn't it? It does me. God, what kind of trip am I laying on these people? Ooh, man, thank God when I got saved, you like, wow, exploded inside of me. And I was like, not only did I feel you, I knew you. <laughs> and I'm thinking, boy, Lord, why can't you do that for them? And God says, I can. They're the ones that are hindering. It's like, really, Lord, you could do that for them? Yeah. But then they would be emotional, like, oh, yeah, Lord, I don't want them to go to emotional salvation, believe me. <laughs> Ooh, wow, that a trip and a ride. Roller coaster city. But for me, when I got saved, there was no doubt. I mean, my eyes were open. My, I was just phenomenal. It was just amazing. It was in heightened awareness. It was like a dead man had suddenly come to life and all of my sensory perceptions were suddenly there. And I don't mean just, you know, the supernatural ones. I mean the natural ones. <laughs> wow, it was... I could smell things. I could see things. Everything was sharp and clear and focused. I could know good and evil. I mean, I, I had all these things that just happened when I got saved. Pew! Instantaneously like that, from the top of my head to the tip of my toes. Now, I'll admit, not everyone has that experience. Some people are a slow process. Some people are a slow burden. But the one thing you must learn is an assurance whoever you are and however God saves you, 
because in each individual life he does intervene there is no doubt about that Romans promises us that you know when they knew the the, when they had the knowledge of God, they changed the knowledge of the incorruptible God into the corruptible man and you know, worshiped the idol or worship creation rather than the creator. And so at some point in time, you have a certain amount of knowledge that's been given you, you know, a little bit, a little bit. And that little bit in here, you know, is enough what we call saving faith to reach out in some way to God and cry out, God, if you're real, show me. Take me to a place where I can know that I'm saved. Follow after that thought. Think about it. Take me to a place where I know I'm saved. Now that could be a place on your knees. It could be a place on your couch. Crash. It could be a place where you're sitting here watching this video and suddenly you go, yeah, and this is the record that God has given to us eternal life. And this life is in the sun. And I have the sun. So if I have the sun, I have eternal life. So I'm assured of some issue. But if you don't study it, if you don't prove it, if you don't make it a part of your personal life, if you haven't applied it personally and you're only listening and you're not thinking, if you haven't made that real, then I hate to say it, you might not be real when it comes to salvation. You might be superficially acknowledging this idea of salvation and not the reality of having a personal relationship with God. Until you make that determination one-on-one -on -one with God that you are saved and you are going to stand on that for the rest of your life, that you are going to mark that day as this is the day the Lord has made and He made me and I am knowing that God has put His Son in me. That this is my salvation and I am assured of it because I have the Son of God in me. I have Jesus. And no other name will save me except the name of Jesus. And I can cry out to Him and He will answer me. And I can call upon Him and He will hear me. And I will ask Him and He will tell me that I am His Son. And He will perfect me and present me faultless before the Father and see him joy. Until you know those things, you're always going to be doubting your salvation. And you will not go much farther in life. You will have flip-flop in everything. Your relationships will suffer, if they even last at all. Your determination to do something will falter, because you'll have doubts. Everything that requires that foundation of solidity, of a solid, sure foundation built upon the Word of God, built upon Jesus himself, built upon that which is everlasting, you will stumble and fall unless you have that assurance of salvation. It is the number one priority for your life, and it's your homework assignment. Are you saved? Yes or no? Do you know you're saved? Yes or no? If no is on any of those, you need to get that assurance. The only way you can is by asking God. The only way you'll know is by God revealing it to you. Father, I pray that even as confident as we all seem to be, we all still rely on your Spirit of God to determine for us whether we are saved or not. You alone are God. And you alone are our salvation. You alone have provided for us the means with which we can ask and receive, with which we can seek and find, with which we can knock and have open to us the way of salvation. Jesus died for us, O oh God, and there is no reason why we should ever doubt that availability of having grace and mercy extended to us because you love us. You said so by declaring that you love the world and that you gave your son for it. That whosoever would believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, God, I know it says should not, so I pray that you would cause them to not perish, that they would go beyond the should to confirm for them would not, 
so that they would know in their hearts that Jesus is alive, so that they would know in their minds that Jesus is real, so they would know in their personal relationships that you have opened up the spiritual realm to them and you have made them born again, that they should know the Son of God in life, in love, in death, and to follow him all the days that they are existing in this dimension that we call reality. So that when it comes time to leave this earthly world behind, that, oh God, they would see you and find acceptance and love and mercy and kindness and gentleness and most of all, grace. For surely, God, you have saved us by your grace. So, Father, reassure us as we work out our salvation with fear and trembling for you are holy and we are not but confirm to us so that we are confident in you that we can always appropriate your love for us that we might run to you when we have need that we might jump in your lap as a real father so that we can sit and listen to what you have to say about our salvation that we could not have done without you that you have given to us freely as a gift. Thank you, O oh God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Spirit. Thank you most of all, Jesus, for what you've done. Amen. Want to know what number two is? You want to look ahead? Make sure you do your homework. Remember, are you saved? You better make sure. It will affect everything, and you need to go no farther than to know that first. And as I don't have my glasses and I drop them, as Jesus would say, behold, number two, self-image. <laughs> and so it shall be. Oh, praise the Lord. Next time we see each other, that tomorrow or the next day, or whichever day it is, when we continue on in Principles of Life, we'll be discussing self-image.